Hi, Zachary. Thanks for joining me, friend. Hi, Toshin. It's good to see you again. Yes. Yes. So today's a big day. Uh, the last day or so, we've been working on launching our project that we've worked on for, I checked and it's like, depending on when you say we started eight or nine months ago that we started working on this. So wow. uh, it's been a long time coming and I am I am, I am really happy to be sharing with this with the world. And um, we're gonna be talking today to get to know you better and also to kind of go through the project and, and see how it worked and what happened and share that with folks. But um, I'm curious just to start, how are you feeling about launching this thing? Well, I've been preparing for so long for this to launch. And it's just, uh, it's been so exciting to see the, the positive attention it's releasing. And um, just some of the comments have really touched me. And um, I, I feel real excited that uh, everyone's work can be seen, um, not just mine and yours, but the, the music producers and um, videographers and everyone else who participated. Um, I don't know, I, I'm in a little bit of a, a high just on a, how happy I am with the, how things have gone. Totally, me too, me too. Um... I think everyone's, from what I've seen, has been really impressed with, uh, yeah, the music and then also, yeah, just the film is um, that you made is just incredible and it's been nice to see people be touched by that. And of course, as I mentioned to you, like there's been a few comments where people are really um, impacted by the meta side of things and, and kind of get a download of like, oh, meta could be fun and could look like this. And that's that's, you know, what I was really hoping for. So that's been nice to see too. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's been so lovely to share this like last day with you and see all the comments coming in and see everyone uh, being impacted by it. So yeah, uh, congratulations. We're not in person, but I, I tip my mug of hot tea to you. <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> so one of my guiding lights throughout the whole project has been, I really want to have your vision like come to life. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's it's really happy. It makes me really happy to see um, the response, especially on the, the meta side, mm -hmm. um, which is more your thing than mine, but I, I want you to be able to show that. Mm -hmm. And so I, I feel satisfied that I feel like we have. Beautiful, yeah, me, me too. I think uh, it worked well for the, the animation with the, the vision, so. Um... Yeah, so I do want to. I want to do a really a lot of this. Do a deep dive into the project and hear more from you about what it was like and and what you did and and also show people one of the one of the real pleasures for me was uh, getting to see you work and how you worked and like how an animation film is actually made. So I want to give some people a, that a taste of that. But um, maybe just to start, we could. I'd love to hear from you. Sort of the standard question I like to ask people. I'd love to hear about your story or background and and kind of. Uh, yeah, just who you are, introduce yourself and where you're coming from, what, what your life has been like so far. Well, uh, I'm Zachary Hunley. Um, sometimes I tweet, but I, I do other things as well. Um, I am from Dallas, Texas, been born and raised. And um, I've just always like had an interest in art growing up. And um, when I realized you could make art with computers, that really changed everything. Um, my, my favorite gift growing up was a, a copy of Adobe Photoshop CS5. Mm. And um, I, I spent so much of my free time just editing people's photos for like three bucks on Reddit and uh, doing Photoshop competitions and um, uh, making terrible animations on Flash websites. And it's just always been a hobby of mine. Mm. But um, I got the opportunity to take a 3D animation class in my senior year, my senior year of high school. And um, just seeing all these tools that are used to make the animated movies and TV shows that I love and realizing that the industry grade software is like available to students and you can just start learning how to do that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a just a, a moment for me when I realized that um, this was something I was really passionate about and um, then discovering the visualization degree program at Texas A&M, um, which is designed for exactly these interests. Um, I, I decided, you know what? I'm not going to school for engineering. I'm going to take a chance on this really cool um, dream of mine. And um, I, I feel like it's, it's going to pay off. It's, maybe it's already paid off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
So <laughs> I, um, I've been studying animation, um, 3D and 2D and um, taking painting and life drawing classes and just trying to um, like hone my talents. And um, uh, I've been really, I, I want to put out personal projects and express myself that way. And um, so the, you can do that on some level when you're in university, but with all these assignments and like you, you don't have ultimate control over your art, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, now that I, I'm no longer in university and I am um, like seeking a job and all that, um, like I, this was like the first project where I was like, okay, I, I see Toshin tweeting about wanting to make this happen. I'm just gonna reach out and uh, see what I can do. And it's been a, a learning experience and um, I've, I've further developed my skills in a lot of areas throughout it. And um, so I, I'm real happy now that it's released. And um, my my current situation is that I am uh, looking for a job in the uh, the animation industry at large. Um, I, I'm not a specialist in one specific degree, as you can probably see from the the variety of methods in the video. Mm -hmm. So um, it's the like the animation generalist jobs where I, I'm I'm particularly aiming at the moment. Cool, so cool. Yeah, I know. Um, it's felt like my inner child sort of just gets so excited hearing you talk about it and like certainly working on this project of like, wow, you can make animations. That's so cool. So uh, yeah, I'm happy that you're pursuing that dream. Um, there's a few questions I want to ask you about what you shared. Maybe just to start, can can you share um, what some of the sort of like inspirations have been for you with uh, art and animation? Anything that's particularly touched you or like been an influence on your art? Well, um, like most people my age, uh, Disney films are like what starts the love for animation because uh, Disney is just they were so far ahead of everyone else for the longest time, and so. Um, the Lion King for 2D, uh, Finding Nemo for 3D, um, which I, uh, that's Disney Pixar. I believe they were merged at that point. But um, yeah, I guess the, the, the shining like examples of things that uh, particularly influenced my passion um, were mostly in Western animation, though I, I am watching more anime these days. Um, but uh, the show Gravity Falls, um, it's a, a Disney kids show. I got real into that show and uh, just loved the way it used animation for storytelling, um, as well as uh, Into the Spider-Verse is just like, it, it would be a dream film to, to work on something like that mm -hmm. because uh, they, they took so many different like experimental techniques and put them together. Mm -hmm. And just even if the story was terrible, I would still love that movie just because of how it looks. Uh -huh. uh, and uh a lot of people think of Marvel movies as live action. I think of them as animations because mm. it's all CG. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure the sets are just a great big green screen. Mm. Um, and so uh, I, I have a, a passion for special effects and um, just especially with action, you can do a lot of cool things in action movies. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, that, that I count that as an inspiration as well. So cool. Yeah, yeah. That's really interesting to hear about. Um, and in, in the animation program that you did, uh, what what kinds of things did you have to learn over the course of your studies there? Like what kinds of classes did you take and what did they have you do? I believe there's a part of the a and charter about how they can't have just an art degree. Um, so it, it distinguishes itself on some level for being a technical degree as well. Um, I believe it's currently under the architecture department, which um, it seems off, but the, there's a lot of overlap as well. Um, Makes sense. And so um, we have classes on coding and life drawing, painting. Um, uh, I've taken a VR development class. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the three main paths that people in this degree program take are um, design, like 2D graphic design, uh, animation and gaming. Hmm. And so 
Well, I would love to work on a video game on the animation side. I just know personally, I, I'm not a huge coder. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the decision was pretty easy for me to make. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there are so many people from this program who go on to work at Pixar and DreamWorks and do their own thing as well. So um, it's a nice little community. And in the animation world, it's all about who you know. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Um... What were some of the classes that you like really liked and, and some things that you studied that you didn't like as much? One class I liked a lot was um, the color theory class I took. Hmm. Uh, my teacher is, uh, she was Laura Lisenby and she's an artist as well, if you want to Google her. Hmm. But, um, and I, I learned a lot more about color than I thought there was to learn. Hmm. Um, and like the, uh, I, the, I bring this up because one of the projects for that class, um, I made a spinning galaxy for it. Mm. Oh, yeah. And that's the asset that we later incorporated into here. Yeah, yeah, which wasn't even planned originally, but you showed that to me and it was like, and, and can you tell just for the, the people listening what, what, you, what the project was originally? So I had, I, the assignment was to make like a music visualization um, using different aspects of color theory. Mm -hmm. And I, I chose, um, uh, uh, what's, it's the, I, I can't remember the, the song I chose, but um, mm -hmm. I reached out to the recording label and they did not give me permission to use the song <laughs> and upload yeah. it to YouTube. And so I'd just been holding on to this After Effects file with a spinning galaxy and uh, a bunch of nodes connected in so that um, it reacts to the music. Yes. And um just a little bit of dissatisfaction that I, I could put it on TikTok where they don't care about copyright, but uh -huh. I can't put it on YouTube. <laughs> uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, it was uh, like, yeah, it, it, both between that particular clip that you had already and like the way we got connected, it's like um, definitely for me, experience is just like a really big synchronicity that you know you came into my life. Like just as you're graduating, just as I I, I I was originally the tweet you're referring to, and I'll, I'll mention this in the show notes, but like um, on Twitter. But um, I, I I remember exactly where it was. We we filmed some of the place that uh, I was where I tweeted this, but I I was just out for a walk. I was out going to dance, and I was like, oh, someday I, I want to make an animation. And like, I just tweeted and then, you know, you responded like three days later or something. And uh, we're like, hey, by the way, I actually can animate. And I was like, oh, that sounds cool. So yeah, it came together so much faster than I thought. I, I, I remember thinking like, this is this can and will happen if I want it to, but it's probably gonna be like 10 years from now. And I, I would I would want to do this 10 years from now, but it's like been less than a year since we uh, met. So yeah, that's really cool. Um, I Another class in the degree program, which is the backbone of the uh, uh, the program, is they're called vertical studios, mm. and uh, they're designed so that you work with people in their sophomore, junior, and senior year to make a a, a big project over the semester. Um, so I've worked on three separate animated films with deadlines, uh -huh. and, um, just with a team. And I, that's sort of the like that's going to the grindstone and like really like honing your skill that way. Mm -hmm. And some of them are good. Some of them are kind of bad. Um, I think they're all on my website, uh -huh. uh, ZacharyHenley.com. And, um, but uh, that, I think that is what gave me the, the confidence to like go out and uh, make something on my own. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. And you said you really liked the, the, the color theory class were there was there anything that you studied that you were like oh i don't like this as much um c plus plus um i, I don't comprehend <laughs> um, and um i i couldn't even tell you the names of every uh, uh coding language i half learned and have forgotten <laughs> so, um I, i've got enough of the skills to uh, use them in the way i need but uh, i'll never be like head director of a video game for that sure. kind of thing. Um, sure. So I'd say the mo most of my frustration at, in my college experience was uh, through the coding classes. But um, I think the uh, my life drawing classes were also frustrating. Mm. You feel like you hit up against a wall and um, you see it in your head, but you can't get it to the paper. Mm. And that's 
almost necessary to develop those skills. Mm-hmm. So by the end, I, I felt like I could be proud of the, um, the, the progress I'd made and confident enough to animate 2D human characters for this project. Mm. Yeah, yeah, you did a great job. Uh, what, what kinds of skills did they have you work on in the drawing classes? Um, with life drawing, it's all about drawing from life. Mm-hmm. Um, so you might think drawing from a photo reference is similar, but uh, there's a lot of, the, the way your brain converts a 3D object into a 2D plane, um, you, it's, it's different when you're drawing from life and when you already have it as a 2D plane. Mm. Um, so it, it's that process of doing quick life drawings, um, just little stick figure sketches almost where you're just embedding into your brain the human proportions and just like refining that skill of translating the 3D world into 2D. Mm. And um, I, I tweeted recently about um, how 2D and 3D art are difficult for me to separate because if you want to make something look like it has depth, you have to have an understanding of its 3D structure. And um, with 3D animation, like um, you have to input so many like 2D layers and textures and such. And um, so I, I don't know if I could ever make an animation that I thought was all 2D and hand-drawn or all 3D and um, not taking any 2D shortcuts. <laughs> Interesting, interesting. Yeah, I want to make sure to get into the different kinds of animation that you used and and how those fit together because I think um, if you're watching the video, like, and and you're just an amateur, you might not know that like oh, lots of different styles went into this, but they 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 really fit together pretty seamlessly. But it's cool to hear about how they all fit together. Um, Huh. Um, Yeah. Can you tell me kind of Oh yeah, I want to ask actually, what what you know, just because Twitter was such an essential part of this project coming about, like how did you kind of find Twitter and what's your experience with it been like? So I've I've been a member of Twitter for um, over a third of my life now. Mm-hmm. I did math, um, and I, I tweeted um, just as quality as I tweet today, many years ago, uh-huh. no, no attention at all. Uh-huh. Sometimes I like to retweet old tweets uh-huh. and have zero likes, and then they'll get likes now. So, yeah. um, I've just always uh, had opinions, wanted to put them out in the world, and Twitter is very well designed for that. Mm-hmm. Um, a, uh, I believe I, I originally came to Twitter um, to follow uh, Vsauce on YouTube, mm. and um, that's that's what brought me here when I was like 13 or so, uh-huh. and um, since then I've uh, um, just tweeted to my friends and family mostly um, until over a year, maybe a year and a half ago. Just finding a community on Twitter that was um, more less terrible. I would uh-huh. say much of Twitter is is terrible, uh-huh. and um, just finding people who are using Twitter in a not terrible way. <gasps> Um, <laughs> that's a good description uh, for it it's not terrible here uh, it, it's less terrible less maybe. terrible um yeah. oh. but um and so uh I, i've never been one to have online friends um i'm not big into like multiplayer gaming or whatever um but i can now say that i do have online friends mm-hmm. um and i i find a lot from that experience in, in a way that i haven't understood other people's online friends before. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Definitely, definitely. Well, I'm, I'm happy you found this corner of Twitter because, uh, yeah, it's just it's been not not only did we get to do the project together, but it's been really just wonderful to meet you. And yeah, we got to meet together in person uh, a, f- a few months ago in Austin, and that was really nice. And I guess we'll be at Vibe Camp together uh, this weekend. And anyway, yeah, it's just like through this project, definitely feel like we've made friends and. I, it's been nice to see you make friends with other people on Twitter as well and bring your personality. I like your, I like your tweets a lot. They're funny or interesting or clever. So yeah, it's been nice to have you there um, and to have you in my life really. So um, yeah, but let's talk about the project. Can you kind of tell me um, maybe just really big picture, just 
verbally. I want to dive in and, and see the, the nitty gritty parts as well. But can you tell me what working on this project was like for you? Um, how it, what you did, kind of the scope of the project, kind of just big picture. Tell me about it. So the scope of this project is absolutely larger than any other creative project I've done yet. Um, and probably for some time until I, I feel ready to commit to another thing of this size. Um, and uh, I, I have so many small things I, I feel like I should do first. Mm. But um, so I guess I just from my experience in the the vertical studios, I've got um, just some skills for um, using like Google Drive and Sheets to organize projects and. Um, to, to keep lists of which scenes are done and which have more to work on. And um, just to, to iterate through every line of the animation pipeline and um, get something out at the end that looks like it would be a crazy amount of work in the beginning. Um, and so um, because of EBSynth, which we'll discuss later, I realized I could on my own produce an animation of several minutes length that looks like it took a team of people to work on and previously would have without a lot of these time-saving stylistic techniques. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I had this feel like I, I want to do something um, at this scale, which would normally take people a lot longer or in a much larger group. And um, uh, though the, the original estimations, it has certainly exceeded in the time it would take, um, it is still, I think, um, impressive for the four minutes with the one person. Definitely, yeah, very impressive. Um, can you say, um, we'll kind of show what this might look like later, but can you say what EBSynth is? Sure. Um, so there's this software, um, which I'll do my best to explain and um, show later. But what it does is it takes the style of one frame that you change from a video and it intelligently applies it to other frames in the video. So if I um, recorded myself, like just turning my head like this, and then I took one frame in the middle, opened it up in Photoshop and gave myself a mustache, it would do a pretty good job of applying the mustache to all the other frames in the video. Um, and it doesn't use machine learning, but it looks like it does. Hmm. Um, so it uses some other technique that just works really well. Mm -hmm. um, and it's received updates um, over the past year, like even throughout the project mm -hmm. uh, that make it perform even better. Um, and it's, it's not quite to the level where I think any like real animation studios are using this as mm -hmm. a huge part of the process. But um, with enough experimentations and workarounds, it can like absolutely be a like an invaluable animation tool. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that the channel Joel Haver, if I have that correct on YouTube, um, he is a, he makes their, they're like not the prettiest animations, but he like cranks them out like mm. uh, on a weekly basis where he'll just draw himself as a silly character. And um, he'll be talking and his mouth is having all these <sighs> artifacts as it's moving, but it, it's, it's very entertaining and just mm. good enough. Um, probably through his videos, I discovered this in the first place. Okay. Um, and I wanted to do it, but at a more professional level of quality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it fair to say that like we couldn't have done this project without that? I, I couldn't have sat down and drawn every individual frame of like you dancing down a mm -hmm. road. Um, well, I would still be working on like the second scene at this <laughs> point. <Yeah. laughs> Yeah. And uh, the the like hand drawn two D animation skills I have are well enough to work with EBSynth, mm. but just on their own, they're not near the quality as when you are um, effectively rotoscoping, which mm -hmm. is tracing over frames of an existing video. Yes. Yeah, because I think um, when you reached out to me. I think there were, when we talked about it, there's like, it's like, well, first off I was interested because just sort of socially from like a social guest perspective, I was like, okay, you have, you have, you've been studying this in school professionally. You 
probably know what you're doing. I, I didn't know you well at that point. I hadn't even really seen your portfolio. I was like, okay, you've been studying this. So that's one thing. But then when we talked about it and you told me about this technology and showed it to me, that's when it became feasible to me that we could actually do this project as opposed to say 10 years from now. Because when I thought 10 years from now, I thought, oh, I'm going to need a studio. I'm going to need a team of like 10 people or more. I don't, I don't even know what goes into that. But like that's, and, and the funding for that, of course, is going to be a thing. But we could, um, you know, I think our time estimates were off our money estimates. Uh, I wish I could have funded you differently. But um, at the scale that we were operating, it was like, this is at least like ballpark feasible that we could do this project because of, because of that technology, at least it is the way it seemed to me. Right. And um, this software, it's EB Synth, and uh, it's free, available. Uh, it runs at least on uh, Windows and potentially Mac now. Um, and with a little bit of technical know-how, if you're a computer person, you can figure it out and have a lot of fun with it. Hmm. So, um, and you too might be inspired to do something more professional once you see the, the, the ability that it provides. Heck yeah. Yeah, I would love to see some people take that up and see what they do with it. Um, yeah, so maybe just to go into this a little further, I want to, I'll say a little bit now about um, what happened. I think there was sort of like, there was the before Zachary stage of the project, and then there was the like when it became your project at a certain point, really. And so I, I'll say a little bit about the before stage, <clears throat> and then I'd love to hear after that kind of, I, I'm sure you have models in your head of, <clears throat> excuse me, what the stages that you went through were. But um, I just want to kind of, it was, it was almost like a, it was like a, it was like a relay race, like of like, there were some people that passed some batons and then you, like you were the final baton. So uh, I want to say a little bit about what came before that and then hear about what you did. So um, I tweeted that tweet originally just out on my daily meta dance walk and uh, was like, oh, this is, this is a, a seed. And then you replied a few days later and I was like, okay, maybe we can do this. Um, someone else, uh, James Baker, who I had on the podcast, replied and said that he would be willing to um, fund the project. And we talked about that he gave the first gift for the project. And um, James Stuber, my collaborator, who I've also had on the project, said that he had a GoPro and that he could make it happen because I wanted it to be a first person perspective video. Um, and um, then uh, I did some fundraising. We, we, we put together a proposal. I talked to Danny J, who I'd worked with on the previous project, and he said he was willing to make a new track. So I put together a proposal, got the funding. Um, also during that time, um, Mandy Wichuls on Twitter said that her brother could help me film it. And so she, um, I worked out a deal with him. So that's like filming, funding, um, music and we had you for animation. And uh, so I got the funding together and then we did a day of filming with Bill and Mandy. And then, and then, and during that time, Danny J was like finishing, he did about, I think he did about five iterations of the track, bless him. And, uh, and um, you and I were kind of working with him to make some tweaks. We wanted to have the end of the uh, project have audio that would work for us. And, then we sent you a bunch of film and a track. And I think there, there was three kinds of film that we sent you. We sent you the GoPro camera footage. We sent you like a ground camera that was, uh, that's in the dance scene at the end, near the end. And then there was the drone footage that's sort of the aerial footage. And we we're like, okay, Zachary, go. <laughs> and we thought initially it was gonna be five weeks is what we budgeted for your time. <laughs> and uh, it took much longer, which uh, projects always do. So um, what, what happened from there after, you know, we'd given you the funding, we had the film, we had the music, what, what kind of stages of the project from your end did you go through? Well, first off, um, all of the pre-Zachary work mm -hmm. was excellent and it set me up for success. Mm. Uh, the footage is uh, high quality and it's in 4K. And uh, I don't think I could ever stoop to 1080p. Mm -hmm. I'm just I'm better than that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Michael Kersey's video uh, with you beforehand was in 4K. Yeah. And uh, he'd laugh at me if I did 1080p. <laughs> 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 so, um, and also 
Danny J. The music is incredible. Um, I might be his number one fan in the world who's listened to more Danny J. Than <laughs> That's true. You've listened to that track thousands of times. Maybe point. even more than Danny himself. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. And it hasn't gotten old. Um, uh-huh. I, I like that song a lot. Oh, so, amazing. Um, so I, I was set up with a uh, great inputs mm. and I got to do something to them and get a great output out of it. Mm-hmm. And so um, I, if I, if I'm remembering correctly, the, the beginning that we did was uh, a lot of brainstorming and bouncing ideas off each other and just me trying to take your ideas out of your head and put them into mine. Mm. Um, and uh, so I, I came into this with some familiarity with meta and meditation practices and um, just some familiarity with you and your brand and your tweets. Um, and uh, I, I needed more though, if I wanted to make something that would uh, satisfy you and funders and everyone else involved. So um, uh, originally I just worked in like a video editing software and clipped together um, things in ways that felt satisfying and uh, not worrying at all about color or animation and just wanting to put together like a plot line and um, th- that kind of thing, it, it, o- it can only develop over time. Um, I don't have the skills to just sit down and ideate an entire like direction for um, a music video. It just, it's what kind of falls into place. And it's just my job and your job to guide it as it comes together. And so, um, for, for example, in, in one scene, there is a reversal that just kind of happens at a cool beat change in the song and you start running backwards. Mm. And um, I never would have planned that in. It doesn't really fit, but it just, it looks so cool. And it's just part of the exploration process that it just has to stay in the video uh-huh. and, um, and, and guide later decisions for uh, further on. Um, and so the, the three main parts of the video are 2D animation, 3D animation, and live action. Mm-hmm. Um, and so like just as a guiding principle, um, I can make estimations on what is possible with 3D and 2D. And um, the, just trying to tell the story of from your perspective, how every point of view shot is, um, has 2D animated hands or something in the front. Mm-hmm. Um, that once you get those basic ideas down, um, and you develop them and you make test shots, you like how they look, then um, you can just start firing away at a certain part of the project. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I believe the um, the 2D hand animations, which I, I'll screen share and show later, were the, the beginning of the, the animation process. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and can you say really quick, uh, you're sort of talking about this, but you made um, several drafts of and what you called an animatic. Can you say what an animatic is and what, what the intention there was? Sure. Um, so animation is very expensive um, with time and just salary. So <laughs> in, a, in a big budget animated studio, they have every single frame planned out before they start putting it on a computer. Um, they've got a big board on the wall and the directors are rearranging pieces of paper and making sketches and um, everything should be planned out. Um, All the voice acting is recorded in advance mostly. Um, And just generally that that is how animations come together just because the animation itself is way more time intensive than like you'd even think. Um, Uh (laughs) (laughs) Something we learned during this project, even you. Even than even I think apparently. and so, um, so I, I suppose uh, we wanted to have a, a really good idea of the, the structure of the video before um, too much of the animation was done. Mm. And um, we stuck to that mostly. And um, uh, the changes later on are way more subtle and um, things people probably don't even notice. Um, but early on, there were a lot of big changes and rearranging um, just the basic structure of when are you dancing, uh, what order are you running through different locations, and um, 
where, how often should you be shooting lasers, <laughs> all, all sorts of things. Yeah. And uh, so I, I feel like that, that was a real good experience for me, just more on the like directorial production side, I suppose. Um, and just like, I don't know, it was, uh, it was a, like its, its own whole thing. And um, I, I feel like I, I can take that with me and put it into the next project I have. Hmm. And um, maybe it'll actually be five weeks next time. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it's funny now because we've launched the thing. It's just, uh, it's funny to look back. So um, maybe a couple of things I'll point out about that is uh, um, one, the animatic that you made was like an actual video that you put together and um, it had, uh, it was set to the track. So like even that video looked really cool to me. I was like, damn, this is this is cool. There was no animation at that point. There, you like had notes at different places like on the screen and stuff, but like it was already really cool. And I, I mean, like in a way it was like um, kind of like progressive stage of iteration of like, I was already seeing the video that we launched yesterday, but just a much earlier version of it that was all live action. And it was also um, um, all, uh, all of the, perspective shots were from the GoPro and the GoPro footage actually probably there's no way that's 4k that's like much lower quality than the, yeah. the like ground camera or the drone I think I think it's like the GoPro was the worst the drone was like second best and then the, the ground camera is like a really good camera that Bill used but I, I want to mention that because um Bill was and, and that Mandy mentioned Bill but um was just such a godsend because uh originally in the way I conceived it, it was like just gonna be GoPro footage and like one that wouldn't have worked as well like in terms of storytelling the making the story that we did but also like the footage was just I mean like it functional for showing my perspective but not very compelling from a like audio quality. so we didn't end up using any live action footage from the GoPro all of that footage is animated that was on your end but um so glad that we had Bill on that filming day and when, when I had him actually it was like but when, when he and Mandy came to help me film, it was like, um, yeah, it's just like, he kind of took over. It's like, okay, here's in a, in a really good way. I, I just want to spend a moment to compliment him because it was like very clear to me that that filming day wouldn't have gone as well without his skills. So like, I was still sort of like saying, oh, we should film this and film that. And like, this is what we're trying to do. But he kind of was like, okay, we're going to take this shot and the shot and have the zoom in this way. And um, I think that that really set both of us up for success on the animation side because it was like you could only animate things as good as the the footage so uh yeah many thanks to bill for all of his help with that um yeah any further comments about the animatic or anything that i think two of two of the main things that um made the animatic like set that up to um like tell like an accurate portrayal of what the end product will be is mm -hmm. one that I am basing the animation off the footage directly in most cases. Mm -hmm. And so it works as a great placeholder until I put animation in. Uh -huh. um, and so that's huge. And then also just you, you you've got this vision, mm -hmm. which I didn't fully understand at first. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I have so many experiments and ideas and throwing things together. And you could just look at that and say, oh no, that's not my vision. Mm. And um, to having that that guide, and um, it, I think it, it brought out work in me that I couldn't have ideated myself. Mm. Um, and it just th throughout the whole project, just in general, you've been incredible. But mm. uh, particularly with the like keeping to a vision, mm. like that that direction, I, I found uh, invaluable. Mm. I'm glad to hear that because it, it feels kind of like being picky sometimes, but. Um... Yeah, I mean, even, I mean, with the Kersey video as well, but also especially this video, it really dawned on me that I was playing kind of like a directorial role of which just like, oh, there's production and funding and seeing how all the people fit together. And um, I think in, in general with that kind of thing and collaboration in general, it's like there's a there's a dance of like vision. And I think one of the things that was really cool about this project is that you wanted to like kind of show off all of the different skills that you had and like kind of synthesize different animation techniques in a way that maybe even professional studios aren't doing, as you said, like they're not using EV synth yet, um, for, like at scale. And so um, I think that was really cool. And so it was, you know, it was like a, a, a push and pull and, and dance of how to 
hold the vision while like making it look really cool from an animation perspective. So I think, uh, yeah, we work well together. So it's been, it's been good. Um, so what happened after, you know, after we finished the animatic, I think that was maybe, that was maybe like two months that we ended up working on that or like a month and a half or something like that. What, what happened after that? So after that, I began um, on the animation itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was most excited about the, uh, the 2D EB synth part of things. Um, and also most concerned because not only have I not done it before, but very few people have like done it at this level, if any. Mm -hmm. um, and um, there it's like, there, there it's new software. It's not, I don't even know if it's in beta still or if it's uh -huh. in beta yet, but um, <laughs> So uh, the experimenting with that and getting that look down and production ready was uh, my priority. So um, I, I don't know if now is the time you'd like to screen share that, but- um, Oh, maybe real quick. Can you tell me just for the amateur viewer of this thing that knows nothing about animation, how would they tell the difference between the scenes that they're, like if they wanna go back and figure out what was 2D, what was 3D, Obviously, the live action is anything that's like a real camera um, really looks like me. What would how would they tell the difference between what's two D and three D and what you did? So I forgive confusion because not only did I use three D, I mean footage of a three D world to trace over for the two D animation. Mm. But I applied two D effects to the three D animation. Okay. Uh huh. Uh, called tune shading, hmm. where instead of um, rendering light bouncing off things in a realistic manner, um, there are automatically outlines on sharper edges of 3D models, and um, the, the colors might, instead of being a natural gradient, just choose a few colors for it to break down. Hmm. Um, and I, I think the best example of this is the scene in the forest with the trees and the plants bouncing around. Um, where you can see that they, all these models which, which exist in a 3D space are being rendered so that if you paused it, it might look like a 2D drawing. Hmm. Um, and I felt that doing that on both sides of the production were necessary for it to feel as if it is all one um, aesthetic together instead of being very blatantly three different things mushed together uh -huh. instead of two things mushed together. Huh. Um, so yeah, I, I guess just the, through the process of refining that look on the 2D and the 3D side is how I arrived at like the final visual style hmm. influences the entire production. Mm -hmm. And can you tell me as well, before we, before we screen share, I think you ended up using something like four or five different programs. Can you tell me which different programs you used and just like very broadly what you used each of them for? Sure. Um, so, I, I 3D animate in Autodesk Maya. It's a industry software I've been using since high school, I suppose. Um, and it might be, it's like, it's like flying a rocket ship. There mm -hmm. are so many buttons. Um, there's probably no one man in the world who knows what every button does. And uh, it's built for almost every part of the animation process. Um, Though most people who work professionally in the field will focus exclusively on lighting, modeling, texturing, rendering, um, like all those things are their own little worlds and all those tools are built in with various plugins to the software. Wow. So um, that, that is just the, the program that my, my brain operates in mm -hmm. and um, that I, uh, I, I've been looking into Blender recently for certain things, but I, I do believe if you have uh, access to Maya, especially if you're a student and you don't have to pay for it, then um, like it, it's it's just a, a beast of a software. Uh -huh. uh, so all 3D animation was done through Autodesk Maya. Mm -hmm. um, and all the 2D animation was done through Photoshop and EBSynth. Um, with some some brief experimentations into a Adobe Animate, um, mm -hmm. some of which made it into the final. But oh, interesting. Uh, Where does that show? Uh, that is the the uh, you dancing down the street, um, the live action street with the 
cartoon Toshin. Uh -huh. uh, uh, some of that was done more like frame by frame by hand, um, just because of the the difficulties of of working with EB synth. Mm. If I if I draw a mustache and then I spin around all the way in my chair and come back, uh -huh. the mustache won't be there anymore. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, um, yeah. And that so, just visually with me dancing there, that must have been pretty hard. Right. Yeah. Um, and so uh, the you can't just draw one reference frame and expect the whole thing to work. You have to do many, and you have to correct for errors afterwards. Right. But uh, but so anyways, uh, that scene was uh, partially just hand animated um, with traditional rotoscoping, just on my drawing tablet. Gotcha. Um, so th those are the two main animation softwares I used, and the uh, I use Adobe just for like putting things together, the actual video editing and compositing. So um, they they work uh, very well together with the Adobe Dynamic Link, which means I can use Premiere Pro as my um, compositing video editing software. And, and can, I can you say what compositing is? Because that, that's something I had to learn during this project. Yeah. Um, uh, well, okay. Premiere is more for, um, the, I guess just editing would be the, the, the word to use for that. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll explain myself and, um, the premiere is where you, you arrange clips and audio and transitions between them. Mm -hmm. And it is more powerful than that, but those are the main things you'd like to use premiere for because there's something else called after effects. Hmm. which is like the like the big mama of all Adobe products, basically. Um, and so that is where I do compositing. And uh, with Adobe Dynamic Link, I can make changes in an individual clip, which go over into the editing Premiere software, uh, which is quite convenient. So um, After Effects is uh, just a, a video editing software with many plugins and... Um, uh, if you want to just change the color of a green screen or um, you want to use the 3D tools that are built into that, um, or you want to motion track something, like it, it does all of these things. Mm -hmm. And so um, that is how I composited each of the scenes. And it, the compositing as a term, the way I'm using it is to arrange elements in a scene um, just to the, the way you'd like them to be in the final um, output and uh, adjust their colors and the ways that they interact with each other and various layers of effects that are applied on them. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in many scenes, going frame by frame and like manually adjusting things just the exact way they need to be to all fit together, like one giant puzzle piece. Um, and so the, it's those four softwares, the um, EB synth, uh, Autodesk Maya, and then Adobe Premiere and After Effects, which uh, made the bulk of the project. Mm -hmm. And what were some of the kinds of visual effects that you did with After Effects? Um, I'll use this as an opportunity to mention one other software, which mm. is Flow Frames, mm. um, which uses, I believe it's RIFE, RIFE, some sort of video interpolation um, software. But essentially what it does is you can input a video at a lower res a lower frame rate and it'll output it at a higher frame rate. Hmm. And it, it uses neural nets or something just to, to estimate what the in-between frames would be. Hmm. And so um, the way I use that along with After Effects was I would input my 24 frame per second um, like 2D animations that I, I made with um, EB Synth. And I would render render them out at like 240 frames per second, wow. just something crazy. And um, I can plug that into After Effects and simulate realistic motion blur um, by sampling the other in between frames. Um, mm -hmm. If you if you look at them in real time, you're moving ridiculously slow. And um, the the only value of that having all those extra frames was exclusively for um, the motion blur and after effects. Hmm. And um, I just thought that adding motion blur to some of the 2D and simulating the, um, the, the effect of motion blur, which fits into 
uh, live action scenes, which naturally have motion blur, would uh, piece things together better. Mm. So uh, using uh, After Effects to simulate that and um, the, the time warp effect is also what I relied on a lot, which allows you to um, play different parts of the video at different speeds and different frame rates naturally with mm. a gradual um, a gradient between them. Um, Where's the point that you use that? The uh, the dancing in um, because you're you're in the grass uh -huh. dancing uh -huh. with your hands to the yeah. side. Um, I, then I wanted... that's not at the pace necessarily that it was filmed at or that I moved my literal body with, but you changed it to match the song. So I wanted it to match the uh, BPM of the music, uh -huh. and um, I wanted to uh, like transition between different positions, and so you hit them as if you, you're you dancing to Danny J's beat uh -huh. yeah. instead of, um, I, what, what music are you listening to huh. in the, in the uh, original footage? Yeah, I, it's funny. I think if I recall correctly, for most of the most of the filming day, I was listening to Danny J's track. And then I we got a lot of footage of the dancing at the end. That was the final shot that we did. And uh, I think I'd, I'd heard it like on repeat, like <laughs> probably, 40 times at that point. And it, it was a little tricky to dance with and I like wanted to give you some other stuff to work with. So I think I probably switched to a different playlist at that point, if I recall correctly. And so it might've been at a different rhythm, but but even then, like even when I was listening to Danny J's stuff, like the stuff that you're picking might not, not have been the same rhythm or whatever, so yeah. But, um, but in, the, in the compositing for that scene, I was uh, frame by frame uh, using the time warp effects so that your emotions align to the beat of the music. Uh -huh. And um, using just fundamental 2D animation methods of um, like the, you, you, want, you don't want things to move at the same pace. Like you want a little bit of a, a bounce, like where it takes a little bit to move and then it takes a little bit to stop moving. Um, like when, when you roll a ball down a hill, it doesn't immediately accelerate to its normal speed. Um, it, it has, it takes some time to reach that speed. And with 2D animation, you can exaggerate that effect and get a, like a, a hyper real, um, look where it's, it's not reality. It's reality plus, and, um, it's, uh, developed by Disney artists and such. There, there are like eight techniques of animation or something like that, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I put them into work using the rotoscoped footage so that you were moving more like a cartoon than you were in the original footage. Mm. Wow. Wow. And I know one of the effects that we made use of was there's a few points in the film that people can probably spot if they look for them where we removed some elements of the live action scene. Like with most notably, Bill, the camera guy the, who filmed things, he had an orange shirt on on that day and it was like totally out of the palette. And, and in any case, even if it wasn't, he was like filming. So um, it would have been kind of conspicuous. So we removed him. And then there was a few other things that we um, removed like signs and, and things with, I think a few trees and bushes and things like that. Um, what was that in After Effects that you did that? That was. So After Effects is also linked with Photoshop. Uh -huh. um, that just one of the conveniences of using the Adobe suite, um, if you can afford it, which is uh -huh. a big <laughs> and, um, so you can choose a, an individual frame from a video in After Effects, and it'll import that into Photoshop and just let you do whatever you want drawing over it. Um, and so I, I went through and I masked out everything we didn't want. Mm -hmm. And I just like drew a little box around it and adjusted it um, so that everything we didn't want is just blacked out. And I can um, use content aware fill, which is just a, uh, it's a, an equation that's been around for a while that just looks for nearby pixels that are similar and can patch things. <laughs> um, it's a software you would use if there were um, like people in the background of your vacation photo that you didn't want mm. and you could just kind of paint over them and um, fiddle with it until it looks like they were never there. And that was and in it, Photoshop, you said, the, the content. Photoshop, yes. Yeah. And so uh, in Photoshop, I removed cones and uh, orange shirted videographers and um, stop signs and identifying addresses and <laughs> anything that um, not only that we don't want in the shot, but I could just 
creatively control if there was a distracting like um, blue trash can or something that mm -hmm. doesn't fit in the creative vision. Um, I could go a little crazy with everything I'm removing. Uh -huh. and, um, and then After Effects uh, is pretty good about tracking the uh, 3D points in the video and applying those um, to the, uh, the, the objects that you're removing. Um, and it, it's not perfect always, especially- You can kind of see the glitches if you're looking yeah. for it, but I think we came to the point where like, it, we, I, the, the thing I had to learn with this was like to watch not for the thing that I knew you were editing, but to watch where the viewer's eye would actually be. And if you watch where the viewer's eye would be, like say me or, or whatever, um, you don't notice these things. But if you look like, oh yeah, that bush over there is like shimmering, like interesting. <laughs> if you look for it, if you watch the video again, you can definitely find these. Um, but yeah, it it's quite satisfying to sit there and say, I don't want this manhole cover, this puddle. <laughs> um, oh, these bushes look kind of weird. like. If this was a, a big budget movie, we'd pay someone to like trim this uh, bush to look better. But I, I can just do it all in post. And do so, it all in post. <laughs> that's okay. a good motto. Yeah. Um, uh, not a good motto if you only want to spend five weeks on something. Uh -huh. but otherwise, right. Right. Um, yeah. And um, so yeah, I I was able to edit a lot of the live action footage and um, yeah, make it fit more with the. The, the story as long as well as the uh, animations. Mm -hmm. um, another good example is the panning up shot of the forest that yes. you run into. Um, I just, I added more trees in the back. Um, so instead of seeing the sky, you just see a, a bigger forest. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that was because it didn't look very visually appealing in the original footage, right? Right. And so just little things like that, um, there, there's a lot you can do with video um, to improve it. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, After Effects and Premiere is also where I do all the color grading. Mm -hmm. And um, one thing I came out of this project thinking is like, I, I really want to learn more about color grading. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's a whole art to it, um, some of which I've been able to pick up, but uh, you, you always want to like go that one step further. And mm -hmm. so that, that's one of the things that I'll be... Uh, uh, studying and experimenting with the, the after this project's released. So cool. Yeah. Um, so I'd love to see these programs. That would now be a good time to kind of screen share. Sure. Cool. I'll just make sure to turn off my self feed here. So right now I am sharing Autodesk Maya. Um, normally when I work in it, I work at a, a higher resolution. So all these buttons are like quarter of their size mm. just so I can see all of them on one screen. Mm. But uh, I've changed that just so we can look here now. But um, here is the scene of you running with birds in front of you and all these 3D objects that you can select individually and make adjustments for. And um, Here's what it looks like. Uh, everything that the camera doesn't see, there's no reason for it to be there. Uh -huh. So um, it's all about getting the shot to look right once it's in 2D. And it doesn't matter how weird it is in 3D. It's all about, uh -huh. yeah. Um, and um, so you can see here how, uh, as you're editing in this view, you can see different 3D renders here and give it some time. Um, uh, especially working at 4K, uh, it's, it's difficult to uh, see what the end result will look like as you're building it. You more have to set things up and um, just kind of cross your fingers that uh, once you render out all the frames, it, it'll look like the way you imagined. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, it, it's it's useful to to occasionally like take a look at what the render view will be on the mm -hmm. output. But mm -hmm. um, so you can see like everything here is, it's made of points in a 3D space and lines that connect them and faces that are connecting the lines. And so just with that, you can build almost anything. Um, uh, virtually all like 3D animation and 3D models are made with little squares or little triangles. Um, 
And so, yeah, that's, you can see this scene here. Um, this is the software where I set up all the lighting and the textures and um, the models and arranged things, as well as the camera motion here. You can play through that. Um, and uh, I spent so much time in setting up these various scenes oh. and for, for the tune shaded ones, just like um, getting things to look just right with the colors of the lines and um, all that. We're having some troubles with the with the roofs flickering. The roofs were like flickering right. in certain parts. <laughs> um, I I still don't know what this means, but the solution <laughs> is something with clip planes. Got to turn off auto render clip plane. So whatever that is, huh. this is um, that that must be how uh, Maya decides whether or not to render an object or the object behind it, um, Interesting. something with that. Um, but so much of Maya is, I have no idea how this works. I'm going to Google it and find someone from like 2012 who had the same problem. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, oh no, their solution doesn't work. It was from 2012 <laughs> and just troubleshooting that way. Um, it, it feels like taming a beast a little bit to use Maya. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that this is where all the 3D work happens. Cool. Um, now I'd like to show the 2D work now. So um, I don't have EBSynth on this computer, but I have the uh, there was the frames I used um, to create it saved on the drive here. Um, Great. So you can see. I'm still seeing you in Maya. Oh. All right, I'll just screen share desktop. See that hand? Yep. All right. And so, there's Bill. You can see Bill in the back. <laughs> there's Bill. Uh, I'm sure he's a great guy, but uh, he just kept walking in front of the video. Why would he do that? <laughs> I kept running in front of him. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, OK. You can see here that um, this is from the GoPro footage. And um, I got to break it down into a sequence of PNGs before I can input it into EBSynth. Wow. And you can see uh, you can see it's kind of like much lower quality than the, than the like ground camera that we ended up using later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so um, my, my process was to isolate clips that I, I think would look good in the project mm. and um, break them down into PNGs and to use um, After Effects to get a mask, which is just a black and white cutout of the parts of the frames that I want to be included in the end result. Mm. And um, that if you input that into EBSynth, you'll get better results as well, which is mm. something I learned. Um, so I've got all these frames and then the mask for all these frames, you can see. Um, and with those, I can choose individual frames, which show parts of your hand that continue throughout the surrounding frames. And I can just go in Photoshop and draw over it in a stylized way, mm -hmm. um, inspired by the, the real life uh, position and uh, lighting of your hands, but taking stylistic um, liberties mm -hmm. as EBSynth will allow. Um, and I'd say on average, every um, maybe 15 or so frames is probably another reference frame. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it would be 15 times as much work to animate something at 24 frames a second with individual frames drawn. So mm -hmm. um, just massive time uh, save that way. Um, and so after you have this which lines up perfectly with your mask and your video. You can plug it in and it'll chunk away until it outputs um, these frames. Wow. So here, this first one here is a good example because um, you can see the mask wasn't super aligned. And so your hand's kind of nubby. There's a, a part missing here. Um, and uh, 
that not everything is going to look great. It is beta software. Mm -hmm. um, but because it's animated, you can kind of get away with some inaccuracies when they mm -hmm. still move realistically. Um, and uh, you can go in and individually um, add new reference frames and edit things together so that these artifacts aren't a big deal. Um, you kind of did that iteratively where you would, uh, th you did this in a few passes, like you made a, some reference photos, sent it to EBSynth, used some of those images, made some corrections, fed it back to EBSynth, is that, is that right? Right. Um, EBSynth conveniently exports its projects into After Effects compositions. Mm. So the, the frames rendered from each reference frame are their own little separate block. And you can go back and adjust um, the values of each frame compared to the reference frames so that um, it, like the, this, a lot of the smoothness comes from um, it, like it will gradually transition from frames rendered based on one image to frames rendered based on another one. And in After Effects, you can tweak that. So um, you can get around some of the artifacts that'll occur um, with some of the frames. But um, it's, it's a lot of massaging, just trying to get things to work um, so that they look good. And um, a lot of adding in new frames. And um, uh, it's a lot of work still, but um, like it's a great, I, I really enjoy just this style of animation. and. Mm -hmm. uh, I might use it for other things and uh, develop it even further, but um, it's it's great fun and um, just a, a huge time saver. But uh, yeah, I remember when I saw the um, first video that you sent me of this, like you know, a clip of I don't know, ten seconds of me moving my hands. It was so uncanny because it was like. You know, th this is something. This is an actual practice that I do. I practice dancing and doing meta. I do it pretty regularly, and I love to move my hands like that. It, it, it's fun. It like it's in, you know resonant for me in the practice. But it was like watching that animation. It was like those are and are not my hands at the same time. It's like that they look like my hands. That's how I move my hands, and they're animated, and that's drawn. And it, I, I can't tell you how uncanny that was to like see the animation for the first time. Of like, uh, it, it was very surreal that it both was and was not my hands. So yeah, the, the AV synth really made that possible. But um, I'm not done there from EB synth. Okay, and this is when I put things into flow frames. So this Google Drive file is. It's probably, let's see how many. Um, it doesn't even say how many files are in here, but this is probably a thousand PNGs. Um, and here, let's see. You uploaded 320 items. Um, but um, so these are the interpolated frames. And you can see it's the same content as earlier, but like a million times slower. There's 100 frames of just your thumb slowly emerging from the bottom. Um, and uh, this this makes the realistic motion blur effect work well. And uh, it lets me adjust things very granularly with mm. the uh, time warp effect and after effects. But um, it also is huge file sizes because you got all these PNGs. <laughs> right, right. How big, how big uh, overall was the whole project in terms of file size? The machine I'm working on right now is one terabyte of storage. Wow. And um, I regularly have to delete files and <gasps> upload them to like the Google Drive because I don't have room. Um, For this whole project. Uh, yeah. My uh, God. Wow. If you wanted to condense this file, all these files, and uh, you had a, a more organized file structure than I did, um, I'd say probably about 600 gigabytes total. Um, wow. Wow. Okay. It's a huge project. And the a file ended up being, I think it was like 1.2 gigs that we uploaded to YouTube. So uh, right. that was, yeah, that and just even the finished product itself is, is quite big. Uh, you can see here, I have 928 gigabytes used on my Google Drive account. <laughs> okay. Wow. Google loves you. <laughs> yeah. All right. So that's, that's, uh, that's the, um, <clears throat> the EB synth. What, what's next?
All right, so here is the Premiere Pro, and this is where I do all my video editing. Um, so each of these clips here in the timeline are uh, various image sequences and um, layers and effects and video footage. And it's really easy to just adjust them and their length and um, just a, a lot of tools to do fairly simple work that you wouldn't want to go into After Effects for. Hmm. Um, and you can easily just drag on like a, a transition to do two different scenes. Like here's a film dissolve. Um, and this is the, the software I used for making the animatic and also, um, arranging and rendering the final, uh, product. Right. Um, and, um, I guess an, another like learning experience for me has been just a uh, file organization. And uh, um, you can see here, this is quite disorganized. And um, especially near the end, it, it got a bit confusing to make changes and be unsure mm. what layer they were in and all that. But um, it still, it worked great for my needs. And um, it, it was very helpful for aligning things to like different parts of the song that I can make little marks at. And um, you, you don't want the the animation to be doing some huge hero shot that I spent so much time on uh, at a part of the song that's not also the same. Like you, right. you want things to um, to work together that way. Totally. Um, Do you have a sense of how many different uh, like resources you have in the Premiere file that you ended up putting together for the final version? Uh, I When I moved it from the other computer to this one, it was about 500 gigabytes, I think. Uh -huh. um, and but just each of those little blocks, do you know, um, like how many of those, like there's video clips and transitions and audio there. Do you have a sense, if I had to guess, it looks like maybe about a hundred there. Yeah, I, I actually could probably, I think the project manager will, if I wanted to consolidate this. Uh -huh. um, We've got 70 gigs available on that. Uh, resulting project, 18 gigabytes. Uh -huh. So uh, that that's its estimation. Um, but that's I, of the I, size, though. Do you, do you have a sense of how many different like resources of different video clips there were? Or um, anyway, I'd say probably roughly um, one hundred to two hundred. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. But um, so the the convenient thing about Adobe Dynamic Link is I can take any of these clips and open them in After Effects. So here's one clip such that took a lot of compositing. Uh -huh. and it includes both 2D and 3D elements. So the um, your, you running here is 2D, but the entire environment and the background is tune shaded 3D. Wow. So in Maya, I, I made this um, uh, environment and I inspired by the original footage, but um, like stylized and um, just made so it would fit with the, the rest of the visual style. And um, what, what I mean with 2D, uh, with uh, tune shading, you can see here, like these bushes, they're only three colors. Right. But it just, it kind of just works. It makes it fit with the rest of the 2D animation because right. if you pause it, it looks like just a drawing. Um, and so uh, in After Effects, you can spend ages just making everything like frame perfect and applying all these effects. Um, like you can see the motion blur of his feet if you look here. And um, that's made possible by all the extra interpolated frames that I made in flow frames. Wow. Um, and um, all the, I've got so many layers here and <laughs> they're nested into each other like a Russian nesting doll. Um, and You're not going to want to look at this like 10 years from now. You'll be like, I have no idea how to find anything. Yeah. And like there, there, are, there are some, the camera exists in a 3D environment here, which right. allows me to arrange clips um, in, in a way like I, as if I were in a real 3D program. Um, and uh, I, I, I'll go into the effects of this uh, laser blast. Um, mm. You can just see all these effects controls where I have a beam 
that is being turbulently displaced <laughs> the load that's then being ripple pulsed and then there's a hue saturation adjustment and then a motion blur like you're just wow. going by and adding all these different layers to um to get that effect and wow so, um i would say i came into this project as maybe a novice after effects user um and now i'd consider myself intermediate uh -huh. because uh -huh. like um just a crazy amount of time spending here that I, I didn't even expect. Um, and um, just learning so much about um, the how to use like coding and like um, add little like animations and presets and everything. And um, especially with the, the zoom out scene of the earth, that was like largely done in After Effects. Oh, and wow. um, it, it almost hurt to look at the file because there were so many different layers necessary for that. <laughs> wow, wow. It's so seamless. I, I, I'm still amazed that you pulled that off, but um, like, because there's like, you ended up doing like four different scales or so that you zoomed out from, and then they just flow together in, I don't know, six or seven seconds or something of like different maps that you made. And uh, yeah, that looks like, I think originally we were planning to do that as a 3D zoom out and the way you ended up doing it looked a lot better, I think. Right, I'll, I'll go a little bit more into um, the specifics of that scene. Great. Um, you're right that we, we started off with plans to do that all in 3D. And um, I just wasn't very satisfied with the look and I thought it could be done better in 2D. And so um, using Google Maps as a visual reference and um, uh, I, I didn't use your exact real world location, but... Right. Um, but Just, we did use Massachusetts, which was cool because mm -hmm. it was filmed in Massachusetts. So, so I, uh, I did a little drawing of just the surrounding area of the grass. And then I zoomed it in Photoshop, made it real small and decided to make another drawing where you can see a little more of the lake. And they're all nested into each other so that they can be put in After Effects and zoomed out as if you are in Google Maps zooming out. Mm -hmm. And um, with the final one being the the globe itself. So and cool. So um, I, I used Photoshop for that, and especially their new neural filters mm. um, and content aware fill, like discussed earlier, where I it almost naturally adds that like organic um, the way a landscape would look, where I I can zoom out and just content aware fill all this uh, empty space, and it'll fill it with similar landscape to the. Uh, the previous image, and I can just throw a, a neural filter on it, which might give it a more, um, a, a style of maybe an oil painting or a screenshot I took of Google Maps or something like that. And um, just through that process and um, a lot of experimentation and um, going back and forth between softwares, I was finally able to get to a, a look that I think is a pretty cool effect. Um, and just zooming out from up close to you to all the way to the universe is like i've always wanted to do that effect in a video and i've never had an excuse before definitely i and um yeah i remember when before we filmed you suggested that we get that drone shot of zooming out and um here, i'll turn the selfie back on um you suggest we get like the drone shot of zooming out and that sort of formed the basis there. And I'm glad you suggested that. And um, it also occurs to me, something I wanna say about the project too, is like the idea was to show what it's like for me subjectively to do loving kindness practice while dancing, while running. Um, but I think, I think this was one of the real challenges with the vision was like how to make it show what my experience is like subjectively without making it about me like the point isn't oh and I feel I feel a little bit cringy about this now like putting it out there it's like the point isn't to make like a four minute music video about how cool I am or something mm -hmm. it's like um, I, mean, I mean I want meta to be cool but it's not about me it's like I want everyone to do meta practice um, but like someone has to do meta practice and this is what it's like for me to do it and you know with laser beams and dancing and stuff so um 
yeah, I think I'm really pleased with the globe scene because that and the biker, which you suggested, and the birds, which you had as well, like those all kind of give that flavor of, um, you know, this is directed towards other people. This is connected to other people. It's not just about me. It's about like the subjective experience of someone doing meta. And it just happens to be me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I'm really glad that we got the globe zoom out scene working so well, because that's like a really critical element, I think, for the meta practice is like, this is for other people, about other people, connected to other people. So I'm really glad we got that right. It also, it fits in with the title well. Yes. Yeah. I feel like I, I would regret if we had cut that scene, like I, I believe we uh, talked at some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, there was a version that you just zoomed out from the field to the universe, and and I think we, we didn't think that looked as good, so. I think I uh, I zoomed out and then there was a bit of a cloud cover uh -huh. and then it fades out and you're in the universe. Oh uh, yeah, right. And, um, that's sort of a, a cheating way of doing it. And I, I like the the one continuous shot uh, that that resulted in a, a much cooler effect. It really did. I mean, it, it would have looked good otherwise, but I think especially well, one is sort of a little jarring visually, but also in line with the vision. It's like yeah the whole planet, the whole universe. I mean, we, we just got the galaxy, but uh, you know, it would have been sort of meaningless to do just like black, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Anyway, I'm so glad we had that galaxy shot too that you did from your school project is like, oh, that's really convenient. Uh, yeah. Anything else you want to say about um, just kind of the technical aspect of producing this? Um, I'll, I'll say that, um... Um, almost all the software I've used is free or um, like heavily discounted for students. Mm -hmm. And so if, if anyone's listening with a similar dream and wants to do a similar degree, like all, all of these things are, are fairly available. Um, and um, like you can download Autodesk Maya like any day, just like you could start going for it. Uh -huh. and, you'll learn. Uh -huh. um, I, I guess originally I was self-taught for all of these softwares before um, uh, going to university. And so um, uh, I just wanted to make it clear that a lot of these things are very accessible and uh, just for fun or for professional work. Um, I, I encourage people to uh, explore their artistic impulses. Uh -huh. um, and um, I guess uh, on top of that, just um, the... Uh, a lot of software you like you I couldn't do this without an internet connection that if you want to be able to do something beyond your skill set, you need to know how to Google it mm -hmm. and you need to know how to follow up on 2014 blog posts, people who have the same technical difficulties as you. And um, I, I'm sure a lot of this is true for people who are like programmers as well. Um, like, it's a real separate skill set to be able to um, follow tutorials and uh, troubleshoot and such for like complicated software um, using the internet as a resource. Definitely. Yeah. There are a few points in the production where you sent me like tutorials of things that you're watching. I'm like, oh, I'm thinking of taking this approach. And that was really cool. There, there was a whole approach that I think you ended up not using, but that I just thought was so cool. It's like, what was that with the, um, like sort of imitating 3D with 2D? What was that? Right. Um, there is a, an animator I follow on YouTube mm. and he um, has a video about two, 2D camera projection mm. or camera projection mapping, which is um, where essentially in the, uh, the 3D software, you find an angle that looks good, like near where the camera will be. And you can just open that up in um, your image editing of choice and um, paint on it like it were a picture and just project those textures onto the 3D models hmm. instead of um, the standard way, which would be to unwrap the model, like you're unwrapping wallpaper or something and um, spend a lot of effort on like getting all the textures and seams and everything to work great. But I was just like, it, it looked so cool that the way he was using it and I was inspired to do it myself mm -hmm. and uh, ran into roadblocks and went an alternate path in the end. But um, it is something I, I would like to experiment with in future projects. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I believe it's it just called like um, camera projection mapping. Hmm. Yeah, that, 
reminds me that something I was really impressed with with you from this project was like, I, I, I don't even know how many roadblocks we hit at different points. And you were like, oh, I'm hitting this technical difficulty, but like, it's no problem. I'll get it sorted out. You said that to me, you must have said that to me 20 times during this. And like, I, for me, I think, I don't know with my own, like, I don't know when I did like programming, for example, if I hit technical difficulty, it was like, ah, I don't know what to do now. And you're like, oh, I'll find a way around this. Like, I'll just do a different, oh, I'll do it 2D instead, or I'll use this method or I'll like find some program. And I was really impressed with like the resourcefulness and, and the ease and confidence that you had. And, and also just like on a psychological, emotional level, like there was no point where you like, I don't know, got angry at me or like freaked out or like got really, um, I don't know if, if I was in your shoes during this project, like in our meetings, I would have been stressed. I mean, I, I think I'm not like a hundred percent easy to work with on this kind of project. You're like, Oh, we could, we could try this out. Like, sure. I'll do that. That sounds good. And just very um, affable and like easy to work with in our, in our meetings. So I really appreciated that a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Um, You're a pleasure to work with as well. Mm -hmm. um, listeners of the podcast might recall the, uh, lovey doveys versus douchebags <sighs> conversation uh -huh. and you're you're a lovey dovey and um even when like it i don't know it's it's hard to be like offended in certain ways like um like i, I can very clearly see your good intentions and the way you live your life and present yourself in the way you tweet and um like good night tweets every night for uh -huh. your followers and all that and like it's just really obvious to me that you're coming with good intentions. Hmm. And um, uh, I feel like uh, as we work together, we we got better at bouncing off each other in that way. And um, I, I'm more on the, the lovey-dovey side of the spectrum as well. <laughs> I'm a pretty, fairly agreeable person. So I, I think that that worked pretty good. The lovey-dovey synergy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, I think what I'm alluding to specifically is like, um, and this has always been like a theme for me in collaboration, which is part of why I wrote that piece about collaboration, but is like, well, I'll tell you what I arrived at at a certain point was like, if there, if I'm collaborating with someone, say I'm collaborating with you and there's a choice that comes down to the vision and I'm holding the vision, I'm like the director of the project, I'm going to choose the thing that goes to the vision, like if it, if it matters to the vision, you know, like, oh, we, we need laser beams for this project. Like there absolutely need to be laser beams <laughs> in this project. Like it's a, it's a requirement, you know, the birds were not a requirement, right. the laser beams were a requirement. But if it comes down to like just an aesthetic choice or a choice that's not critical to the vision, I wanna let you decide as much as possible. And I think that was like, there were a lot of choices that ended up being vision choices where I ended up saying like, no, we, we need to do this differently. And I wish, that it could have been like less like me. I mean, I, I sent you back to the, the drawing board so many times, like we got to do this differently. Um, but it, you know, it was, it was coming from the vision, but I, I can't imagine that not being easy. So, yeah. I, I witnessed a lot of growth in your, your organizational and leadership style just throughout mm. this time. Mm. Um, like there, there were many moments where I would um, kind of get carried away with an idea that we hadn't discussed and I'd bring it to you and uh, I could tell you didn't like it. <laughs> and, um, you had a good reason not to like it and such. And it, maybe in the beginning, it was it was difficult for you to like express that without feeling like you were being a douchebag. Um, <laughs> a douchebag, exactly. But, Thanks, Jersey. Um, but you uh, you became very good at that, and mm -hmm. like um, it was very clear to me like that not to take things as a personal offense and that they're coming from a good place, mm -hmm. and that. Um, it's ultimately the vision that you have to protect. And um, like, if, if you hadn't ever told me something was wrong, then that would have sucked for me as well. Mm -hmm. So um, just uh, throughout, like, I, I feel like you, uh, you were real good at that. And um, we, we learned each other's styles as, as long as the project lasted. Um, Definitely. What would you say? Um, I mean, yeah, this was, this was, you said earlier, like, this is the biggest project you've ever done. What were you say some of the kinds of lessons that you learned or ways that you grew during this project? Uh, I, I sort of went through a period of um, struggling with anxiety and depression, like during this project, mm -hmm. um, which is a part of the reason for the delay. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I, I've made a lot of like, just like lessons learned about how to manage those and how to um, direct my energy, like in the ways that it needs to direct and to give myself time um, just to like, to care about my health as well as a project. And um, I think a lot of that was helpful just because of how caring you were mm -hmm. and um, how, how I could open up to you about things like that. And you would be understanding and like, you, you obviously had a fear of like working me like too hard. And um, like, you're, you're very, um, very good at like guiding and like prioritizing all those things at the same time. Hmm. But, um, but the, the lessons I've learned, I guess, are um, just uh, project management and time management skills. I've um, sharpened a lot as well as um, the, I've learned like the importance of file organization for a hmm. project this size it's really not optional and just what comes naturally to me, I will regret months later when I, I can't understand it. Uh -huh. um, Your future and, self, right? You gotta uh, plan for the future self. And I know it's a cliche, but all of my renders were like final, final render <laughs> at number seven. <laughs> they <right>? really were. <laughs> and um, I, I would genuinely believe, okay, this is the final render. Uh -huh. And um, so that that's a huge lesson. Oh, and, that's so funny, the actual final render was like, hopefully, question mark. Like, there was like, finally uncertainty. It was like, no, this actually did end up being the final one. That's so funny. Yeah. Um, and uh, I suppose I, I learned a lot about uh, working like under a boss or like under someone someone's vision that mm -hmm. I'm like trying to express and um, just how to, um, I don't know, like, the, the interpersonal and the like strategic ways to work in that system. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think it'll, it'll prepare me uh, for my like um, animation industry career, which I hope to uh, enter very soon. And um, like, uh, I, I'm, I'm glad that I, I took the time for this personal project and um, to uh, like, put all of my skills and ideas into one piece that I can show and um, act almost as like a demo reel. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I feel satisfied with how that worked as well. So um, yeah, I, I have a lot of lessons to take from this and a lot to learn still in the future and different experiences, but uh, I'm quite excited. Yeah, definitely, definitely. What would you you mentioned having some depression and anxiety during this project and that, that came up and what would you tell your past self that was like starting this project out about how to work specifically like what advice would you give your past self or someone else that was in a similar situation about like how to work with depression and anxiety on a project like this let me think um i one of one of the big things is not um taking things out on yourself too hard Mm -hmm. Um, it's real easy to, uh, get wrapped up in even a really simple, like, um, tech troubleshoot that you just can't figure out and to, uh, catastrophize and feel like the world is ending. <laughs> and, um, it, it didn't help that the world was also kind of ending like throughout this, uh, <laughs> with COVID and everything. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, and also the, the end of my, like, uh, time in college is also very stressful and as such. And mm -hmm. so, uh, just because of all those things together, I, um, there, there were a lot of times where I could convince myself things were worse than they really were. And, mm -hmm. uh, so I, I would tell my past self that, uh, things will work out and to, uh, trust in myself and rely on my skills and, um, uh, to give myself time and breaks and, uh, sleep is important. And, um, this uh, all standard advice that uh, you can say, but you you kind of have to like live it a little bit to like understand. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, definitely. I wrote this thread the other day about um, worry and anxiety, and you know, from a Buddhist perspective, that's always been the hindrance that's been strongest for me, um, whether it's on the meditation cushion or just generally and. I, I personally wrestled with that a lot during this project as well of like basically worrying if we were going to finish at all. And like, you know, this was the most money that I'd ever raised for a, a project before. And um, 
just like, oh, are the, the funders going to get mad at me or something? Or, you know, are you going to get mad at me or something? And um, something I, I during this project, and I think because of this project, I learned like a way out of that, which was like basically committing to myself that I, I'm not going to worry about a specific thing. Um, in this case, like I'm not going to worry anymore about whether and when the animation project is going to finish. Like it just ceased to be useful to me to worry about that. And I feel like, um, I, I know, I think we went through kind of parallel shifts with that of like um, a certain point where we're like, yeah, we're just going to finish this project. And even though it's taking longer, it's fine. We're going to just finish it and it'll be done when it's done. Yeah. Uh, another like, um, failure mode I run into sometimes is through perfectionism mm. uh, where I'll set unrealistic standards for myself. Mm -hmm. And so I, I've learned a lot about how if you want to put out something that's four minutes long and most of it's animated, like you, you have to say, you have to look at it as if the audience will, not as me seeing all the various flaws and faults and places where it can be better. And oh. um, like, um, so yeah, and especially with a project at this scope, you can't make everything perfect. It, it would mm -hmm. take forever. Mm -hmm. Totally, so well said. I mean, I think we both had to like come to that realization again and again. I don't know, we were talking earlier about the like um, after effects effect of like content aware fill and stuff like that. And like, I, I, if someone knowing about that now can go back and watch, there's probably like 10 spots that we use that, that you use that. And um, like, that's a kind of thing that if you, if you know it's there and you look for it, it's like, oh yeah, that doesn't look perfect, but like you don't notice that it's there if you don't know that it's there and um, it, it looks it looks fine for the purpose of the video. And I think we had to like really learn about those trade-offs and I'm glad we made the trade-offs that we did where we did, yeah. Yeah, um, uh, some of those are like decisions I had to learn to make myself and some of that are like through your guidance. Mm -hmm. And I, I think those together are what uh, uh, made the project succeed in the end. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you would do differently with the project now, like if you were starting again from midsummer last year? Um, besides just a, a better file organization structure, um, sometimes I would just hit the keyboard randomly because I needed a new file name. <laughs> and I thought I'd like, oh, I'll never need this file again. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> that ended up being so, the bottleneck in the last few days was like finding yeah. specific files. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that, that's the big one, but I suppose um, there, there were a lot of just technical things I learned throughout about what's possible and what's not. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if I could go back and give myself that knowledge, it would obviously uh, take shorter the second time through, mm -hmm. but um, you got to plan for arriving at that knowledge as part of the process. So mm -hmm. um, that it's not realistic to assume that you're going to know exactly how every effect is achieved in advance. Totally, totally, yeah. That is the way it works. Uh, yeah. Um, let me see. Yeah, so I guess maybe just last question I want to ask you is like, where, what's next and what are you hoping to do now? I mean, you did mention wanting to work in animation and get a job, but yeah, like what's next for you and what are you hoping to do after this? In the animation industry, you can't just give your resume. You have no. to give your demo reel also. And um, a demo reel is like, in short, a cut of your best work. Um, and they're often edited differently depending on the application. Mm. Um, and so, but because that's so much of the focus of the job search, um, that is uh, what I feel um, I've, I've already begun now to, uh, to edit those and send them out and all that. Mm. So my next step is uh, I want to start building a career and working my way up in the um, animation, special effects, video games industry. And um, I feel like I can, uh, I can arrive at a, like a career that I like in de like decades down the line. Um, once I like see the state of how things are now mm. and I can operate within that environment mm. and um, so I, I'm just, I'm excited to like get my in. And um, so I can like uh, just do my best work and um, uh, work with a team and have access to even more like house resources and all that. Um, mm -hmm. And I'd also like to continue expressing myself online and doing personal projects. Mm -hmm. um, 
I have uh, drafts of blog posts and um, web comics and um, TV show pitches and so many things. Mm. And uh, uh, I have TikTok drafts that I, I had to step away from TikTok because <laughs> it's it's too addictive to also have a job at the same time and uh -huh. have TikTok on my phone. Um, uh -huh. But uh, I have TikTok ideas I want to act on now and cool. stuff like that. Cool. So um, I, I just want to continue um, uh, putting myself out there and building a body of work online and um, entering the animation industry and learning a lot and um, just being able to work on projects even bigger than this one. Heck yeah, that's, that's good. I'm, I'm, I'm like uh, very excited to see where you go from here and like what you end up making and uh, we'll be following your career pretty closely. Uh, I'm curious what, what goes into, I could imagine a world where you know, you're describing like um, getting a job in the animation industry and then working on the side. I could also imagine a world where you kind of did a free, freelance work and kind of things like this project more frequently. Um, what, what goes into that trade-off for you and what makes you want to lean towards a professional animation career rather than working on your own? Well, um, so this project wasn't my first freelance project found mm -hmm. through Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, there were several logo design and um, just profile pictures and little side jobs like that, um, which were a good stepping stone to give me the confidence to do this freelance project. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, but I would like to work at like a company with a, a salary and um, like a, in an, in an office environment. I don't want to, to work from home uh, mm -hmm. most likely if I can avoid it um, because that's like where all the, like the bleeding edge of animation stuff is happening. That's how you get access to it. Mm -hmm. um, and the animation careers are very like idealized and like a lot of kids have that dream. And mm -hmm. um, I'm sure parts of that dream will be shattered with reality confronted. <laughs> But, um, uh, but in other ways, there will be like new excitement, exciting things that uh, weren't even possible when I first had that dream. And so um, I guess uh, I, I want to get the experience, the in, um, and it's all about who you know, I want that in. Mm -hmm. And from that, I could take it in many different directions. Um, and so potentially um, my like long-term career aspirations don't have to be under a company. Mm -hmm. um, they might be, that might be how I decide I like it, but uh, it would also be really neat to uh, be completely independent and just do my own little projects and have those, um, have enough interest and attention and uh, income to support me as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I guess I'm, I'm at a stage in my life where many people are like the day that they graduate, um, but just push back a little bit for me so I could uh, get this project in yeah. and which feels like a good decision in hindsight. Mm -hmm. I'm glad. Yeah, there, there's a few variables there of like, um, I mean, one of the things I, I learned, I wish I wish that I had slowed down a little bit to raise more money for you. I think we should, should have paid you more for this project, especially because it ended up being longer, but um, hopefully, yeah, it's a good demo reel for your job search. And then, um, yeah, I think also you're gonna, I'm excited for you if if you get an industry job to like work with other people and and kind of see industry standards and like get a lot of experience there of like collaborating with people and um i think that was maybe a downside of this project of like working 100 percent by yourself on animation of like yeah it's just i think you'll learn a lot and really thrive in an environment of peers and mentors and stuff of uh that kind of thing so i don't know if, if you can pull this off that you, you said you're 22 now yeah yes yeah if you can pull this project off at 22 by yourself, like if you have some years in industry, I, I, I'll be very interested in what you can pull off with even more skills in the coming years. So as I said, I'll be following your career closely. I, uh, working alongside other artists is a huge way to grow. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, though I did work some on the on campus, like in studios, it was during a, like a part of COVID where there weren't very many people there or I, I wasn't near them. And so, um, yeah, the, that I, I agree that that was a, a bit of a limiting factor is to not have that resource of other people. And uh, that's another reason why um, working at a company and within that kind of role, I think can be a, an opportunity for growth. Totally, totally. 
Anything else that you want to mention or share or just chat about related to this project or animation or anything else? Um, I, we haven't really mentioned render times yet. Mm -hmm. I think that that was a very irrelevant recurring thing in, mm -hmm. throughout this project. So I just like to explain and uh, 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 ponder on that a little bit. Yeah. But, um, rendering is the process of the computer taking all of your work and like turning it into a video file. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in 3D software and uh, in 2D software, like After Effects as well, it can sometimes take a very long time. Um, and so, uh, which might be convenient if you want to like take a break, like the computer is working for you. So <laughs> on some level, it's appreciated. But on another level, it would be great to see things in real time. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the trends in the industry I've noticed is with real-time graphics, um, their quality is um, growing to be on par with what um, like things that take forever to render in the past would look like. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are projects out there working with real-time graphics and video game engines and such. And um, I, I'd be real, real curious to go down that path. And I, mm -hmm. I've been uh, researching a lot into it before and um, uh, various studios are using it in different ways and such. But mm -hmm. um, just because that rendering was so much of this project and um, sometimes there would be like hours or an entire day just to render something out mm -hmm. even on like very um, like tip top computers and everything. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then we, we transitioned, we, we, we owe a lot to the, the student computer lab that you had that you worked <laughs> at for I'd say the first half of the animation project. and. We got a lot out of them and also your parents, many blessings to your parents who helped out uh, in various ways. And um, yeah, we owe a lot to them. And also, I mean, something that I'm reminded of from talking to you is like, we really benefited from one, the technologies that are available now, but also like, yeah, during the course of the project, things improved with EV synth and um, also your knowledge, but like different programs that became available. That, most notably, I think there was one point where like, EV synth got like both a lot faster and a lot better during the course of the project. You were like, this is taking like half the time and it's better. Uh, and I was like, oh yeah, that's great. So my, my interest is always going to be with what the cutting edge is. Mm. And uh, I think that'll be a theme that follows like my creative output for my whole life. Mm -hmm. um, and the, with virtual reality and so many other technologies now, it's like one of the most exciting times to enter like computer animation. Um, the, the career I have in 10 years is probably unfathomable to <laughs> now because it probably yeah. doesn't exist. Yeah. So, well, who knows if this will be possible, but I would, I would love to work with you again and do something 10 years from now. That's like a similar project, but, uh, even cooler, like I, you know, with, with more technology, more skill. I mean, I think, I think this idea in this project is something that could really be revisited with other like mediums or, um, you know, just higher skill level. So, uh, it would be really cool to revisit it together someday. Yeah. That would be. Yeah. Or a video game. Someone suggested a video game today. So anyway, let's just make a video game company, Zachary, never mind this animation industry thing. <laughs> we got this. If I had to make a video game right now, I just might die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you need some, some good friends. So uh, yeah, and some celebrations. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, anything else you want to talk about or mention? Um, well, Vibe Camp is coming up mm -hmm. um, within the few days. And uh, do you want to talk a little bit about your uh, dance party, which is somewhat related? Yeah, sure, sure. And, and some people people on Twitter will probably know, but if they don't, um, if someone listening or watching Vibe Camp's a in-person gathering of Twitter people in our neck of the woods that we were talking about. Um, yeah, it'll be about 400 people there in Austin. You're in Dallas, right? And uh, so mm -hmm. also Texas, not Dallas, but um, yeah, and I'll be leading my first in-person meta dance party. I've done a few online but uh, it'll be my first in-person one. And uh, yeah, there'll be a guided meditation at the beginning, probably about 20 minutes. And then about an hour of dancing after that with tracks that are EDM and are sort of connected to love, meta, lyrics. Um, it's tricky to find 
stuff that um, really fits, which is why I've been so happy to work with Danny J on this stuff. But uh, I, I do have a growing library of tracks that kind of work and are also fun to dance to. And uh, yeah, the set's really good. I just polished it up today and uh, I've probably made like four sets at this point that are for this kind of thing. And this is definitely the best one. And uh, yeah, I, I'm just excited to dance and share Meta with everyone. It feels like really good timing after all. I mean, I think we were originally planning to launch in September, but it's like, yeah, it's right before Vibe Camp uh, the week of, and probably mm -hmm. a lot of people that have come that will have watched it. And uh, yeah, I'm excited about it. It's obviously, a, a, I don't know all what to expect and uh, it'll be a little crazy, I'm sure. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I'm real excited to see you there again. Um, mm -hmm and other people involved in the video as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's right, that's right. So it should be really good. But um, yeah, we'll see how it goes. It's going to be a once in a lifetime event. There'll only be one <laughs> first Teapot Vibe Camp. So it should be good. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for uh, this time, Zachary. It's been so cool to dive into the nitty gritty of this project, sort of like a director's cut or something of this project and uh, see how it really works. It's been such a treat for me to see, like just to get to watch your process. And it's really lovely to share that with people. And um, yeah, thank you again for just making this project possible. It's, you went above and beyond on, on making this possible. And uh, I, I'm so pleased with the video and I hope you are too, and uh, that it helps you going forward in your career. And uh, yeah, I'll be curious to see what you do next. I'll thank you again on a professional and a personal level. Um, it's been an, an honor to uh, do this with you and just a pleasure to get to know you better. Um, and just, I also owe a huge thanks to my parents who have been incredibly supportive throughout all this. And um, they believe in my dream. They could easily think I'm crazy. Um, <laughs> and so uh, I, I just, their support in so many different ways throughout mm -hmm. has been just amazing as well. Definitely. Yeah, many thanks to your parents. So, yeah, well, thanks again for this time and uh, looking forward to sharing this with the world, Zachary. It's been a, a blast. Mm -hmm. Definitely.